Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, if you like these episodes, make sure to subscribe at aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M.substack.com. You can also go to patreon.com slash tawahido. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. My special guest today is Deacon Dawit Muruna of Washington, D.C., in the greater DMV area. I have been serving in English language services here in the West Coast for about eight years, and and throughout this time, I've always uh, been checking out the scene, and I always appreciated my brother and everything he's been doing out there, and we got the the chance to to meet a few times over the, the past few years at, at various conferences, one that uh, his group, YOTC, uh, hosted, another one hosted by U-O-T-Y. He is a published author. He is currently a student at the Catholic University of America. And at the same time, he has not neglected becoming a student of the traditional schools of Ethiopia in one of my favorite subjects, Kini or Gu'uz poetry. And Devin, no one to me. Amen. Amen. May, may the peace of our Lord be with us all. Amen. There are so many topics we're talking, uh, you know, off camera, and there's so many topics we can cover and get to. Let's begin on a, on a fun note. This year in the Western calendar, back in January, started mm-hmm. off with World War III memes on Twitter. I, I know this as a, as a school teacher, as students, especially in high school, they were all a buzz because a Persian politician had been assassinated just a few weeks ago. Something has happened. So we know that the international scene has been crazy. Locally in America, this weekend, we might still be hearing new news and it seems like the dust is settled, but there's still a lot of chaos and, and disorder here. And back home in Ethiopia, some yeah. people are calling it a civil war. Some people call it a law enforcement agency. I know you've you've caught some flack in trying to be neutral and represent a genuine voice of the church without picking sides. Could you tell me a little bit about that and, and what your thoughts have been uh, in handling the the kind of the people whom you serve? Yeah, uh, you know. <laughs> This is the lighter note that we're starting on. Um, <laughs> so, well, you know, to be to be serious, uh, it's not a laughing matter, and it is uh, extremely uh, disappointing. Here's why, you know. Uh, <laughs> I would often say growing up, uh, and I always like to say controversial things, so here's one of them. Um, growing up, I would say I can't wait until the people over 40 years old pass on to the other world. And the reason why I say that is, you know, I, I tell my my dad all the time, he gets mad, like, you know, that generation messed a lot of things up. And my whole kind of like hope was in this new generation. And me growing up, um, I don't know what generation I belong to anymore, but, you know, back then it was like the younger generation. Like, we just didn't care about politics. And, and I remember kind of sitting down and watching our parents argue about, you know, this and that and the third. And we'd just be like, what, what are they fighting about? Just like, chill, relax. So I always had this vision that once these over, I used to say over 30, and then I became 30. So I started saying over 40, uh, <laughs> we'd, we'd kind of pass on the new generation would just fix everything. Like I, I had this vision in my mind. Until recently where, you know, um, all the things that have trans- has transpired in the past, first of all, even, you know, the past five years, uh, initially when the protests were happening five years ago, I was there in Ethiopia. I witnessed it. I wow. know the impact. I've talked to the people, what it does to them, to their psyche. So I, I realized this, these are serious issues that people try to diminish. When I saw these things taking place, like in the region of Ethiopia, I started saying, this is a problem. And I think it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And it seems like people keep complaining, but keep doing things that is just going to make things worse. And it doesn't seem like people are going to 
<laughs> get back together. Again, it wasn't my place to say anything because I feel like I'm ordained as a deacon for a specific goal. That is to preach to the youth in America and North America or whatnot um, about Christianity. That is my group. That is the people that I speak about. Not to say that anything else doesn't matter, but that is why I became a deacon. So I speak on these topics. The past, I would say, I don't know, three months or, or so, I've seen youth groups that I teach fighting with one another over the things that are happening, mm -hmm. right? And, P I, I, and I get people are on a far extreme side to all this stuff, but my job at this point is to unite the youth group. I have to do that. That's my job. My job is not to take somebody said, whose side are you on? I'm on the side of the youth, right? Like I'm on the side of the youth. So I've been posting uh, uh, YouTube videos about um, and on Instagram about love and, and, and peace and unity, and I've been attacked uh, <laughs> by some. Uh, and, and and thank you for that. I just you know like uh, oh, man, that's a blessing. It is a blessing. Uh, and uh, you know I just want to say I want I'm gonna keep on doing that <laughs> because um, I I do think people are not listening to each other and people have just you know, uh, went on the, the, the last video I posted is what happened to humanity. And I felt like when we get emotionally attached to things, we, we're, we're beginning to forget the things that, that matter the most, which is, you know, the human beings and like love and unity and peace. And, and we have to keep preaching that even though people may not want to hear it. Yeah. It's very fascinating. You bring up an issue that is, I think a larger issue and, you know, people talk a lot about, the liminalities, the in-between spaces. You and I are Ethiopian Americans. We're, we're deacons of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahedo Church in North America. And so there's a little bit of both going on, but you know, what we sometimes don't understand is that there are totally different contexts and settings that we don't necessarily think critically about. I think our parents and grandparents to an extent, especially our grandparents, grew up in a society where everyone was pretty much the same thing. You know, you're either an Orthodox Christian or a Muslim most of the time. And yeah. so there weren't a lot of choices, but in America, there's a lot of choices. And the way that Christianity comes from Puritanism in the United States history is that it's it's congregationalist. It's yabord uh, kristina. Uh, it's uh, based off parish councils. And so the whole structure and format is different. And one of the big things that they wanted to do in this country was give 501c3 nonprofit status. And so the big cry from the early 1800s to the present in the United States has been the separation of church and state. Interestingly, though, where we come from in Ethiopia, whatever mm -hmm. regime you looked at, church and state has been one since the very beginning. Even mm -hmm. when we're talking about the Ethiopian eunuch or when mm -hmm. we're talking about King Gizana and his mm -hmm. conversion, church and state all the way through Emperor Haile Selassie and even with the involvement of the, the communist uh, Marxist junta, mm -hmm. with the involvement of Ihadig, uh, at every step and uh, corner of the history of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, the church and and, and state have been kind of one in the same thing. How, how do you think that has either, you know, helped or, or, or hurt us? And, and how is that kind of Im impacting how you, how you deal with that? Well, to me, uh, the, the, the history of the church and what it has done for Ethiopia, um, we just cannot deny that. And I'm not gonna, you know, get into it too much right now, but I, I will tell you this, um, Part of my research of what I'm doing is to go back and, and right now, again, another controversial statement. I am very much cognizant of the fact that there's a group of people who say that the, the, the idea of this, I am an Ethiopian, is, is, doesn't apply to them. And they find it offensive. And uh, I had a conversation the other day with with uh, a buddy of mine who was like, you know, this concept of Ethiopia just doesn't exist. So I'm cognizant of that, uh, and and uh, I am very, uh, I don't want to dismiss. And this is the problem right now. We we keep dismissing each other. Well, I can't expect somebody to listen to me if I'm not listening to them, right? 
to listen to someone you don't have to agree with them yeah to 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 listen to someone to 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 understand and to have empathy with what someone is going through you don't have to you know argue with them and the, the problem and the fear i have right now is we don't agree on history in the past 150 years That's and right. i'm willing to have a dialogue about that past 150 years in the context of whatever needs to happen to create peace i'm willing to do that if we're talking about the past a thousand years or fifteen hundred years, I mean, we we have data from the Greek source, Syriac source, Arabic source, uh, just over you you know like something you just can't debate, and that's part of the things that I'm going to talk about today is the fact that there was a unified country known as Ethiopia. I mean, we just can't we can't we we just can't forget that it, it existed. So part of my and what I you know what I want to continue to do is to show people look there was definitely a country we had problems we had issues but 1500 years ago it was a the Aksumite period I don't think people understand how huge it was on the world scale right uh, I believe it was the prophet Mani who who likened uh, the Aksumite period to Babylon China and uh, Persia, I believe, uh, and Rome. And the fourth one he said was Aksum. Like, the, these are, the, there's uh, Ethiopic words in the Quran. Like, the, 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 the empire was so huge, it even influenced uh, Islam. I mean, this is huge. We have the word Hawariyan. Where did it come from? It's not Syriac, it's not Arabic. <laughs> from what? Well, you, you, there you go. So, and this is not something like, you know, I would hear like my parents saying Ethiopia, Jagna Ethiopia and stuff. I would be like, hey, guys, like you're just saying that. This is something that is being discussed about in the world like of scholars. I mean, they recognize these things, right? So I feel like there's something lost, something lost. And, and what is being threatened is that like there was at one point this idea of a country where we came together and we were at peace. Somewhere along the line, and I know this is where we get fuzzy, we lost that. Somewhere. You could blame it on Amaras, Tigris, Oromos. We could have the discussion. And that's the thing. I'm willing to have that discussion. But we need to remember there was once a, a period where we lived together. We wanted to live together. I mean, that, that's just like, and I could present my case because that's just like, you know, um, and all over the sources. So what we need to do is, number one, we need to, like, recognize we're being emotional start listening to each other and start writing history that we agree on on a generation so people are not confused for the generation that comes after us because right now we don't even agree on on history people just simple history people are not agreeing uh on on what's happening right now i i promise people keep saying they're gonna forget it it's not gonna be important this is embedded in their head like in everybody's head in everybody's head and and it's gonna affect generation after generation. We're gonna start forgetting what really happened, because two narratives are being told at this point. That is dangerous, even as a scholar of of like history, or or or. And I'm not saying I'm a scholar. I'm saying as a scholar, anyone scholars out there should be terrified about what this is happening. We're telling two histories at the same time. I mean, this is just insane. So sorry, I'm being emotional. Like I said, I, you know, I think one of the videos said we shouldn't be emotional. We should be spiritual. And, and I, I'm committing that fallacy right now because I am emotional about it. And this is not about me wanting people to divide, wanting people to separate, but we seem to be forgetting something. And the reason why that's happening is because people are not coming to the table and talking. That's the only way to solve it. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. That's right. And I'm so glad you you turned the clock back because one of the most frustrating things, you know, in Instagram slideshows or, or kind of tweets that people have is, like you said, people looking at a very narrow history as if history began with Emperor Minilik and having moving goalposts where at one point we're talking about a culture and at another point people bring in biology. I remember Elizabeth Warren in the United States got in trouble because she got baited by President Donald Trump to taking this test to prove she was a member of this Native American tribe. And the Native American tribe, when she did that, got frustrated at her 
because they said it was always a European colonist's idea to have a purity test. That's not in ours. In, in our tradition, if you're a member of the tribe, you're a member of the tribe, full stop, period. Like that's the end of the discussion. And so you shouldn't have never taken the test if you really valued our values. In the same sense, Ethiopia, if we're speaking as Ethiopians, as you said, has existed for quite a long time. <laughs> um, and, you know, I wish, you know, just as I wish for all humanity, I wish for all Ethiopians to be together. But if the only solution is, you know, peaceable splits, I'm even open to hearing about that and what exactly that looks like. I can tell you, uh, you know, fin finne is not on the table. <laughs> that's not, that's not, that's not on the table. Like other things I'm open to hearing about, you know, like, is eminence but, prime minister but, Abiy Ahmed bad me? It's impressive in that he gave up land for peace and 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 stability. And I know that frustrated a lot of people. And I, I just, I, 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 you know, people are like, wow, like let's go back to the time of John Wayne. I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to because, like, I understand and I'm again empathetic with the fact that there's a group of people at this period who see that period as not being reflective to them. So I get that. So we need to hear people out and say, okay, what is what, what are you talking about? But I do want to go back into, the, into time. And that is, again, the Aksumai period. I think we, we really should study that period and understand what it was. One of the frustrations that I hear is, you know, the Orthodox Church has been this Amara, pro-Amara, uh, you know, kind of church. Um, again, I'm willing to dis discuss the past 100 and 150 years, but there are certain facts that we should look at when we're looking at the Aksumai period again, like where the church kind of existed and where the root was. So at that period, uh, <laughs> when Christians were in trouble in Egypt, the Orthodox community interfered just because they were Christians. Mm-hmm. This wasn't even about like e East Africa and like the, the Ethiopia parameters. This was anyone who is a Christian, we're going to interfere at this period. That is the mindset that existed. So if somehow, as other communities are saying, there was this sense of losing it, then we need to go back and fix it. And it's okay to, to say that, you know, like uh, I'm not, again, I'm not agreeing with anything. I'm recognizing people's pain and saying, look, we, we felt this way. 50 years ago. Okay, let's fix it. Let's go back to the time where we cared about everyone, right? Because that period did exist. When the, the Najran Christians, of course, the famous Najran, it was King Caleb who sent people there, risked his own military, his own people. And this these sources, again, are written in Syriac, Arabic, and all, all other uh, uh, um, texts as early as, what was that, 6th century, I believe, or yeah, so? Caleb, yeah, yeah so, so this is the history, people caring about Christians. I mean, this is just a fact that, like, you know, like we can show documents of when that happened. So the people cared about, if you were a Christian, I got your back. If you're a Muslim, I still got your back. Because there were a lot of Muslims, of course, we, we know the history and how, how that happened and that lived there. So if, if people are saying that we lost our way in the middle of that and Ethiopia became something that it wasn't anymore, then our generation needs to discuss about not you're wrong, I'm right type of mentality, but okay, let's sit down and let's create a country. Forget what our parents are telling us, like forget that. Let's create a country where we can coexist together. And in my view, in my humblest opinion, let's redefine what it means to be an Ethiopian. If you think, if you think that Ethiopia doesn't include you, I'm willing to redraw the definition or re redefine what it means for you so we can all embrace this country as what like it represents. Me. This is the type of d discussion our generation needs to have. But we went backwards. Uh, we are like, your ancestor did this to my ancestor. Your ancestor did this. You know, um, I know I'm going on a rant, but you gave me the floor, so I'm just going to keep talking. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. That's what this is for. So, you know, uh, 
I, I get into this kind of like uh, theism and atheism debate, and upon that, one of the discussions that are brought up is morality. What is morality? Does morality exist, right? So within that, there's a branch of people who study like communities and like how they interact with morality when they don't have Christianity. And believe it or not, there's a code of ethics that exists in like, like the places that you think are the most primitive. And things like stealing, killing, and, and like just crazy rape and all these things are wrong for their village, you see, for their yeah. village. But these things in certain communities are completely excused the minute you cross bridge and go to another village. Why? Because they're no longer us, they're they. Uh, what frightens me right now is we're teaching a generation there's a us and there's a they. So when you hear ideas that don't belong to you, you're like, you're part of the they. And you're teaching people how to hate. I mean, this is just dangerous things. The things that are happening right now, I'm, I'm genuinely afraid, you know? Um, so when people keep saying, whose side are you on? It's a wrong question, right? It's a, when we start saying there's a they and there's a us, then your code of ethics changes. Right, your code of ethics changes. So again, uh, all this to say, like I have, <laughs> trust me, I have a lot to say on this topic. I want to say it all now, but you know that's kind of um, how I feel about the situation. That's good. No, it, it's it's even. Uh, you know, we should, at the bare minimum, <laughs> as a church, see each other not in this us versus they or them mentalities. This kind of mm -hmm. tribal otherization that would excuse a lot of atrocities you know a lot of people have made homages to rwanda you know they keep doing it they keep doing it uh you know especially for those of us who spent time growing up in the 90s we remember when that was on tv and we definitely if we didn't remember that we remember the movie that they made about it that would come about later and uh, it's a very it's a very serious matter. And what a lot of people don't appreciate is that these things, they happen gradually, gradually, gradually until they escalate. And when they escalate, sometimes, you know, I like this, uh, this one Sunday school teacher used to use this great analogy that once you take toothpaste out of its container, it's a lot harder to put it back in. If anyone's ever tried mm -hmm. that, they can go try that at home. It's a safe experiment that will mm -hmm. show you or at least hopefully remind you that it's easier to escalate than to de-escalate. And, you know, our, our goal as Christians is to de-escalate, to, to seek the kingdom of, of, the, of the Prince of Peace. It's interesting. We, so we mentioned your, your university. Can you tell us what type of student or studies you're in there? And I think it's incredible because when you talk about it in general, the thing about your story that really stuck out to me when I first heard it for the first time was that you quit your field of engineering to get into this kind of work that we're talking about that I think is generally in the humanities, although may have some crossover with some social sciences. So could, could you tell us exactly what you're studying and how was that transition from engineering to what you're studying now? Yeah, so um, there was, a, it wasn't engineering to humanities, there was a bridge in the middle and essentially, um, let me back up. So when I was in, in college is when, you know, I was doing engineering and, you know, I've told this story a million times and I, I, I even questioned my faith. I questioned or orthodoxy. I questioned everything. I did my own form of a college uh, study type of research and was like completely assured that, you know, Christianity was real or whatnot. And, but it wasn't until I prayed and really started being connected spiritually that I was like, okay, I need to kind of submit my life to, to Christ. Uh, Post-college, I, I was also in the nonprofit world. I had co-founded like a nonprofit and like, uh, you know, we were collecting books and like, you know, let's nice. help uh, Ethiopia and all this idea. So I was like, you know, I had to make a decision between these three worlds, right? So there was engineering, there was uh, a church, and then there was this nonprofit world. And I was like, I can't do all three. So one got to go, and that was the church. The church got to go. 
it's not my place. It's not my, you know, like I love it. Like got you, you know, let's go Mariam, right? So that, that was like my kind of attitude. And, and then it wasn't until I started serving at the church and I like, and I want to be careful and I, I want to make sure like people don't misunderstand me. Like, uh, who is it? I want to Gorgorios, I believe, Zazawai, uh, who says, right? And I, I saw that. Like, you go to Sunday school, all these kids sitting down doing nothing. Um, and I went to Debra Salam, Kaddis Mariam, Beit Christian. And my friends that I grew up with weren't going anymore. So I, I understood there was a shortage. So I said, you know what? Like, nonprofit is a good uh, area to work in. And I was even going to go to Canada, go to grad school. I was going to, like, completely neglect my engineering uh, uh, work. Uh, funny story, when I got out of college, I purposefully was not applying to engineering jobs. Wow. And I was applying for nonprofit positions for $30,000 or $40,000. Um, and this engineering, the, the first engineering job that I got was, you know, more than that. Uh, and <laughs> people, people could go look those up. <laughs> Yeah, I, I even called to say, is this what I'm going to make in the future? Is it now? And like the lady laughed at me, you know. <laughs> so so the, the way that I even took the position was I kept getting denied for the nonprofit positions because, you know, like like my I had a, a internship and all that stuff on my resume, but they were all engineering related, not nonprofit. So the, the, the way that I even took the patent office job was like, oh, OK, like, all right, I'll settle for an engineer position. Like I was like, I it just like, what can I do if I can't get any nonprofit just for the time being, I'll take engineering. But my heart, yeah, but my heart was in nonprofit. Then when I got into the church and I saw like literally, I mean, like there was nobody there. Like there was very like, you know, the, the, the people were, they needed teaching. So I started getting into that, reading Andamta, reading the good stuff. And part of the frustration started when I encountered people that I looked at as my role model. And this is for people listening out there who are in a, in a leadership position of telling me that I didn't belong there. Wow. And, 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 and Explicitly and or were they oh, beating around the bush? You. This is not for you. Uh, wow. We learned these things at Gadam. Uh, you, you, you is just, you know, like, this is just not for you. So, I mean, it was like very blunt wow. and my position, my job was to stand up there and look pretty for about 30 minutes to, to high school students. That was, that was my job. It wasn't anything outside of that. So the minute like you do anything more, um, I write about this in the book. Uh, we started, um, a, a Friday evening program from 9 PM to like, uh, to 1 AM people wow. wouldn't leave. I'm talking about 18, 19, 20 year old kids. They would call each other from hookah spots and come to the church to hang out. <laughs> <laughs> this actually happened in DC. This really happened, you know, like, yeah. and you know, at the church of Mariam Beit HaKistan, this is time that I, this is not like, my, I always talk about this. This is not my doing. This is like, look at what the church can do if we really, um, you know, focus, of course, uh, I was labeled as um, a problem maker. Uh, and uh, they, you know, certain people said that people had to leave by like 10 o'clock. Um, and my students told me, we're going to go to the club. Like, we're just not going to go home. Um, you know, and, and uh, there's a lot of frustration at that time when I think about it. A lot of things happened. Hulum uh, Gono. Later on, uh, so I, it, it became to the point where I just couldn't go to work. Like physically, I wasn't okay. And even to the point where my mom even kind of saw me, it was like, like what's wrong, you know? Um, and it was like, I couldn't sleep and stuff because my mind was on like more church stuff, more, like yeah. I just need more. And of course I heard about Kane and what Kane does and how it opens your eyes to, to Giz. So I said, I got to go learn Giz, you know? I really didn't have a plan, like not even a plan B, but like, what is after that? I, did, I didn't, yeah. like, I didn't care, you know? Like, were you <laughs> trying to be Wamber there for Kene or go into Mas'af and, and learn some of the scriptures? Sometimes people spend a, a lot of time in, in those traditional schools. 
Yeah, and, and not even just that, but like, okay, and then what? So you're going to go learn, gonna, and then what? I was like, I don't know. I just got to learn the stuff. You know, like that was, that was yeah. just like my thing. So was it, I didn't even know um, if I was going to come back. Of course, I didn't tell my parents that. <laughs> <laughs> so That's went, classic. That, that okay. actually makes you very much like everyone in our tradition. I have heard so many stories of monks who left home at 10 years old, 15 years old, 20 years old, uh, you know, so much younger than, than you were even at the time. And, and they ditched their parents. I was going to write a letter to my parents. That was initially what I was going to do. Like, you know, it's been fun guys. Like, thank you for everything. <laughs> see you when I see you. <laughs> like, and then, like dip. And then I was like, that's kind of mean. So it, I wasn't yeah. even going to talk the first. So uh, I'm glad I did. Um, I went, and then uh, basically, you know, people say, you know, even now, I, I'm not going to mention names, but, you know, uh, uh, Gizak, I mean, I, I really don't like, you know, um, and I, I, I really don't like I'm a student. I, I think like I have a lot of stuff to, to, to learn. Um, and uh, when I was there, maybe I should have stayed more, but I I got sick. Uh, there <laughs> Uh, at one point, bugs or what? What happened, man? I've been oh, sick every time I've been to Ethiopia. No, uh, one time I had like a, a severe case of strep throat. It was wow. like real, real bad. Um, and I didn't know. I couldn't even walk. It was like I was shaking. Uh, and my any member he he like stopped class. He forced me to go to the pharmacy, and um, he like paid for the bus. I was like, what? What are you doing? Uh, I mean, the, the love is just like, you know, um, and I, I and I got the you medicine. Yeah. And my brother is a pharmacist. So he told me what, what kind of stuff to get and all this stuff. And it's funny. Uh, I had to take it in the morning that the medicine mm -hmm. uh, that I got. And so I told the the the, the main father there is I give you that. And now uh, I was also at that time, like I was, you know, mega wise. It wasn't good. Like I like I started right really getting hoodie and mama gym, but like it was just a lot. So I was like already kind of talking about like, look, I don't think I could pull this off a lot longer. Um, mm -hmm. and when I got sick, I told him, oh by the way, like uh, I just want you to know I got medicine. So in the morning, because it's hormonal, you can't eat yeah. anything before one p.m. I was like, I, I got to take this medicine, and then he said, I want him America. Let me hear how I live. And I was like, oh, I learned ya, but I didn't understand the grunyal. He was like, yes, God, if you add that much of a challenge, I was like, oh, golly. <laughs> wow, it was tough. It was tough. Um, all this to say that I think that was the natural part where I, I, you know, I, I wasn't built for that, you know, and maybe I failed. I don't know. Who knows? But I did finish the kane. Uh, I officially graduated. Uh, and now. And don't finish my class at Jamrina, but by the way, is that uh, that's amazing? Uh, yeah, that means yeah. teaching other students, right? Yeah, yeah. My class at Jamrina, and don't very like just one or twice. Masna uh, garam. I mean, that's like a, it takes a, a little bit. It's like a first step is anyone my child because I wala my class at like tutoring, and then masna mm -hmm. is like people come and tell you that can you correct it for them. Kaza zarafi, which is like you begin to tell people kane and they study your kane. Uh, not as a student, but as a teacher. You're not a teacher yet. And then you become a teacher. Like that's fully certified. Um, go ahead, that's amazing. Yeah, I've, I've seen you do that in a sense in various times. You've tagged me a couple of times on Facebook, for yeah. example. <laughs> it's really fun when yeah. uh, everyone gets to work on it. My Amharic is way stronger than my Gu'uz. And, you know, that's not saying much because my Gu'uz is not strong. But I have fun, like, playing with it. It's very puzzle-like. And I've never been in, in you know, in a, in a classroom. So I, I don't even know anything about the rules or anything. I, you know, I know the the various names because I hear people saying stuff like that, like Gubayak yeah. Anas Manadam, things like that. But I, I just know a little bit of Gu'uz. So just following along and seeing how people solve the puzzles and, and see how you do it like sometimes especially when you mix languages that's yeah. that's very interesting that's got to be your niche too because i don't think many people could do that yeah 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 it's, it's fun i believe it or not i i have an easier time doing giz canis um i guess because it rhymes better or or something than um like english english canis is the hardest one for me to do uh because the rules just doesn't doesn't allow you i guess it's the language in itself i'm not sure but 
Yeah, uh, but, I, I'm, uh, I'm trying to imagine Kine Zema in English. And what, what, would, have, what would that <laughs> sound like? <laughs> but it's based on syllables. So I felt like they could do it. Uh, everything is based on syllables. So uh, um, it's, it's not really, once you learn it, it's, it's a mathematical equation, which the engineering came to help me out, you know? Because yeah. it's an equation. It's an, it's an equation. So that's they, right. They, 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 you know, they, a lot of people talk nowadays about representation. And if they don't see someone, like them doing something like that then yes. it's hard for them to do that thing but once they see someone you know pioneer that they begin to say oh okay maybe i can do that too you've been involved in in a lot of these english language services as as you've uh said and and there's actually a point i want to get back to a, about that because it it's very weird but it goes back to our being in multiple spaces but i think the way that you described it it almost sounded like a sense of tokenism so i, I want to get back to that and i think right. we can dig into that but when you came back and and told people i remember even when we we're at the the conference together in minnesota i was pushing right. you to kind of share people uh like like one poem so that people could get excited about it because I, I thought it was so exciting that that you went out there and, and you uh, you humored me and, and you did it but uh did did you get other people kind of talking about any more who maybe otherwise wouldn't have like i don't know maybe the 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 hookah lounge crew is now thinking oh what is this Kenny? not just in Kansanamta, <laughs> but maybe maybe in my future it's, so I, I don't know if it's me, but I, I can say like growing up, the idea of like even like I didn't even know there was a thing called Kenny. Like, you know what I mean? Like I grew up here. When I see the youth group trying to do Kenny and like working and, 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 and trying to figure it out and what's the sound, what's the work, it is such a beautiful thing to watch, you know? Um, so I do think there's like now a more of like, oh, I could do this mentality, uh, which is great to watch. You know, of course, we have Diakon Gorgorios, who's also learning here in America. I mean, like this, this is just a beautiful thing to witness. Right. Nice. Uh, so it, this is letting us know Kenya is not uh, it's hard, but it's, it's doable. It's definitely like, you know, um, doable. And I, 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 I People think again, like I don't know. Like if you put me next to a Kenny person, you're like, okay, that's Kenny. Uh, so if I can do it, I always tell people, like you know, anyone could pull it off, and they could do it a lot better than I can. Uh, keep in mind, lick nebab charasheno Ethiopia headquarters, literally. So I don't have any background of the church, like some deacons do here. I mean, like they're doing amazing things. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. So uh, right when uh, I got ordained in Ethiopia, and uh, I came back here, and uh, I was, like, nervous because I was, like, okay, I got to do Kandase. And I went to this church. I'm not going to mention the church's name. And it was going to be, like, my first time doing Kandase, so I'm nervous. So I go super early. They don't know me. I just know, like, one person told me told me to go there, and they set up everything. So they were, like, you just got to show up. When I show up, they're, they're reading Dersan. They're reading Dersan. And they were, like, Dak or now. I was, like, yeah. So he told me to go up and read it. I read it and get his, like, I just read it. So I guess he never seen someone reading get is that fast, especially a youth or something. So he assumed I was a Medigita. <laughs> and then, so I think it was like, I say, but it's a And then he was like, I say, but it's a I was like, exactly. Because I don't know what it is. Like, <laughs> <laughs> the only thing he saw is like, you, I could read good. So he yeah. just like, and then and then he's like bello and i was like mm. and then he's like i churun and i couldn't like i didn't know it yeah. and then he said it himself and he was like salu i was like Nsalli. you know like i just <laughs> oh <laughs> and then like you could see in his face like who are you you know cuz yeah. i like, who did who couldn't read good and then not say say but like yeah. like who you know and it's then like you have huge, huge arms, but like chicken legs. If we could use a gym example, like you're, exactly. you're, you got a lot of hypertrophy, like you're super strong in the <laughs> reading out loud and recitation tradition and could even play with guys, but hadn't spent as much time perhaps singing and, and memorizing the various liturgical rubrics. Exactly. And then at the end, he was like, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> that, like, I got you. And <laughs> So, was, you know, I was like, I, I, I still am. I'm in a weird box. Like, you can't really put me anywhere, right? Yeah. Uh, 
and then of course uh once i heard about the catholic uh i actually joined catholic as a, a theology program and the, the mdiv program mm -hmm. and uh when i was like why do i keep learning about thomas aquinas i mean he's great but like like that, you know I mean, he's amazing <laughs> but like my then syriac heard, my syriac brother he's a sub deacon he was on this program before he said uh to them we did not receive in our Syriac tradition the writings of Augustine, even though he's a pre-Chalcedonian saint. We did not receive his writings for eight centuries. And oh, wow. so a lot of the growth of the church was fully ignorant, for better or for worse, of sure. Augustine. Yeah, uh, of course, I have the kind of like a, a special feeling about Augustine that we could talk about another day. Uh, I'm uh, weird in that sense, but... Um, yeah, so in Catholic, essentially, I, I so this answer is taking a lot longer than expected. Sorry about that. No uh, problem. There's no, there are no time limits here. It's, we're perfect. free. Perfect. So, um, and then I heard about, of course, uh, the uh, famous Aaron Butts uh, and the program that he was doing there. So I was actually about to just quit the program and like maybe even considering going back to engineering. And when I heard about this program at Catholic, I mean, I just could not believe there were manuscripts after manuscripts. People are studying. In Giz, right? Are you talking about Giz? Giz. I think, you know, I don't want to misquote it, but I think like over 700 manuscripts or so, like uh, that the Weiner collection has. Um, I mean, like, we have to learn it. It's, and then it, at that point, it wasn't even like I should learn it. It was like I have to learn it. So I just got in and I've been. There, finished the master's, finished coursework this semester. In Kwandasada, that's big. Yeah, yeah. So now I just have uh, research to do. That That's amazing. And do they make you kind of uh, declare an intention? A lot of people who are doing the type of work you do, they go and then they try to become a professor. Like, are, are you trying to become a professor and then do your own research or what, what type of, uh, you know, intention or aim? I'm sure you had to give a research statement or something like that or an essay. Um, so you just say why you're interested to apply. You tell them why you're interested in the program. But my my end goal is um, I think we need some type of school here in North America for Ethiopian Orthodox. It is special. It is unique and it needs to be studied, uh, especially now, like, I, again, it's a beautiful thing to see so, so many youths like uh, coming to the church like this. We didn't have it growing up. You know how it is. Yeah. Um, so I, I could tell you my story is yeah. for 10 years in a row, we went to church and there was no gospel teaching or anything. Yeah. We would yeah. learn ha-hu. And when I say ha-hu, I don't mean ha escapa. I mean literally the same row of ha-hu is kaho <laughs> every week. And I would sit there like, this is crazy. And people yeah. would sit outside, throw water balloons at each other, and play Pokemon cards. Yeah, people love church. People love church for the wrong reasons, but they loved it. <laughs> the 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 running joke was um, parents would say like, "I don't want my kids to go to church because I don't want them to mess up." You know, it was like, "Oh no, <laughs> oh no." <laughs> it was a bad thing. Those kids, those church kids. I mean, it was a bad like uh, time. So. Uh, but you know, um, uh, but so again, it, it's a beautiful to see these kids like posting. <laughs> I mean, like, again, I didn't know these things existed at their Same. age. Same. Yeah. Uh, I was Not telling uh, an adult. Exactly. And it, Kidan Malet, I didn't know there was something called Kidan until right before I went to get out. You know, like I just didn't know it. Like you know, to me there was kadasi, and then I just knew how to read Mazmura Dawid, Dawid Bagaz. Yeah. So again, I'm like in this weird box. But I think a Catholic, I really uh, Catholic university. I don't want people to be confused. So, um, <laughs> uh, but now it's getting more press. More people are looking into it. More people are giving it. Um, I, I think it was. Uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name, but there was a, a, a deacon who came. I did uh, recorded it and, and posted it on YouTube. Um, Dr. Uh, Rodas. Yeah, uh, he came to Catholic and recorded it and oh, posted it on YouTube. Really? Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. He, he gave a presentation or something? 
No, he just came to visit, um, and and he recorded it. The the Catholic um, bishop of Ethiopia came to visit. That got a lot of press, um, and I'm in conversation with a lot of clergy members to get them to visit as well. So, it's, yeah, uh, there's there's this yeah. gap. I I had been in touch even with. Uh, and I won't name names, but one of these professors of Giz, who you'll find at various Semitic departments, who is not of Ethiopian descent. And one of the more interesting conversations that they that we had, and we've seen recently play out, for example, uh, I will say this name, the Afro-Asiatic Journal, I don't know if you followed that uh, kind of controversy, is this relationship between and this is why it's interesting why you're you're in both of these camps the traditional school traditional knowledge versus which which is you know afro asiatic or eastern in basis and the western model which we can probably trace back to aquinas of uh research university and kind of uh i mean we see this even play out in ethiopia in addis ababa like the Paul Seminary versus the the Holy Trinity uh, Spiritual College, but wh what do you think about the relationship between kind of academia as it is in the United States, popularly known, and and the traditional school? Like, what type of relationship should should those things happen? Because I see when either of them become too narrow and too siloed, they're missing out on whole categories of know where to draw the line in between those two um i have to be careful because uh it's it's, it's a, a question about my fathers and my brothers right who are like my colleagues so it's like <laughs> uh um but uh you know i'll be truthful and, and and this is the thing for me so uh when i research whether it is the Bible, uh, I've done some work on Ta'am uh, and that that's kind of like my thing now. Like I'm, I'm fascinated about um, this genre. We can talk about that later. Um, they are spiritual books for me, which my forefathers have have given passed down to me. Now, why did they write it? They wrote they wrote it down so it could be read. So when I am investigating it, when I'm researching it, I'm researching my faith, right? But the minute you put it on public domain, you cannot tell other people how to see it mm -hmm. and how to interpret it, how to study it. Um, people may have their own motives. People may have their own ideas. But you can, like, as a person, I just don't see how we can say, tell other people, look, I'm going to praise you only if you say positive things about me. <laughs> and I'm going to condemn you if you say anything negative about me, regardless of the, the evidence, one. So I have a problem with that mindset. The second thing is my job and how I see my life, my, my, my role in this is to study this and, 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 and be, you know, um, People like basically like as a generation, we need to have more professor getachos, right? Like, yep. so people like him who are scholars, so of course, people even say negative things about him. Um, but yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's up to you to learn. And, and as a scholar, there's a forum out there. Um, I have spoken to, I'm not going to mention names, but people uh, who are of non-Ethiopian descent, as you say, who have published things about Ethiopia that I had a problem with mm -hmm. and said, I respect you as a scholar, but ABC doesn't make me feel comfortable because of, you know, X, Y, Z. And you're able to have that conversation when you are in that field, right? There's a certain way to talk. There's a certain proof that you show. There's there's text that you could point to. There's secondary resources, primary sources that you're aware of that will give you the tools to say, okay, even when I disagree with you, I'm not just getting mad, no. but I actually have the tools to show that this is the way it is. The last thing that I want to say, which is extremely controversial, is um, people don't know what Orthodox Sohado is. People don't know what the church is, 
right? And they have this, a lot of the times when people refer to Orthodox Sahadu, they're referring to what they saw growing up at their mom's period or their dad's period, right? So um, Orthodox Sahadu is, is a lot richer than that. It's a lot bigger than that, you know? So when we talk about certain traditions, like historical names and historical figures and stuff doesn't define what the religion is. It can't. Right, the religion is dogma, something that no one can 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 change. So if like through research, certain things has been shown that we're just like kind of used to, and it makes us un feel uncomfortable. Where I mean, that's what the research shows. It's up to us to to say the other way. You can't really get mad at like the findings. I mean, like so. I think uh, this goes back to like being emotional and like and and and, and you know. But again, if we have kind of a, a, a a plan, like beta Christian and to put her in the world as a researcher, I don't need to start researching uh what did Tamara Mariam do to the for the people? You know, it provided them a sense of security and it was a spiritual guidance and it really played a huge role. And you could type about the the the, the um uh, literature behind the kids. You could you could write about that and, and show how beauty the language is. So even the the research question, I think, says a lot about the person. The research question, you see? So what are you trying to show? I'm trying to show that this had a huge impact on the world. Like, you know, uh, there's a, uh, and I have to be careful here because the, the findings are not made public, but uh, there's reasons to believe there may have been influence of like the genre of Tamara Mariam influencing Europe, something that people don't talk about. Wow. Yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't yeah, really. I've, I've usually heard it the other way around. So that's is, very fascinating. Is. And that, that, that is the, again, like the findings haven't really been published and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's not really, I, 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 I haven't We won't get it. you in trouble. We won't yeah. get you in trouble. And uh, get, hopefully but, but, they're right. not watching. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you know, there's maybe not the whole genre, not maybe definitely not the whole genre, but certain aspects, certain miracles. Again, if we if we get time to talk about the miracles of Mary, what they are, what they did, um, we could talk about that. But you know, I I have reasons to believe that some of the miracles may have impacted the other way around. Um, these are research questions that I can ask as a faithful person the impact of the church and all these things. So there are things to do with it. I don't think research alone is evil. I don't think white people are evil. I don't think they're, you know, like these, this type of mindset really is, uh, whenever like we start thinking this, right, I don't think we, we do good for the church. It seems I, like we I, have to I appreciate that. Um, you have this grand vision for the church, but it's not like a ABC one, two, three agenda you're following the facts and the evidence of the literature in kind of a scientifically rigorous way, but as applied to the kind of the corpus of the good is right, which is our, our tradition. And, and I really like that. What, what's incredible, as I said, is, you know, everyone is trying to be a specialist nowadays. And in a sense, you say that you're hard to put in a box, but at least I think one fair box to say is like a, a, a true generalist. And I'm, I'm a, a true generalist as well. And I think that there's a kind of a resurgence of people being talented in different ways because you're with the most traditional school in rural Shoa, uh, Amhara region nowadays, but rural Shoa historically. At the same time, you're in the United States in academia. At the same time, there's this third group of people, we mentioned it earlier, I wanna expand on it now, that you've been able to speak to, and that is the Ethiopian Americans that we were talking about that that really, you know, that you said brought the emotions out in you. Uh, t tell us about your book and what is it, the the kind of message that it's it's meant to, to convey and and if you can give us a piece, I love the fact that you did your own audio book as well. All my favorite authors do their own audio books, so I like that aspect as well. Uh, it cost a lot of money, and I only sold thirty copies, so hopefully I'll sell more uh <laughs> of the audio book. You mean? 
yeah the audio book was extremely expensive but um uh to talk about the book you know and to bridge it with what we were talking about earlier i have the mindset of like i am very confident in my church like i'm not i'm not in it and that was the one thing like back in college starting from college that i kind of had to like you know at the end of the day I'm, i am an engineer so i have this like logical mindset of like okay like where's the evidence and if i can't believe this like i can't i can't i can't go to church like i can't i can't i can't just stand i i can't i can't right so it's either <laughs> true it, it, it amazes me it's either true and i'm gonna follow it or it's false and i'll just get rid of it right Nothing so the halfway. reason why, yeah so the, this whole research thing and all this stuff is i have nothing to hide like you know what i mean like it's just like as a, as a clergy member of the church please i want more people to do research so that people can see how beautiful the church is amen do you see if we have something to hide that means we ourselves are doubting the faith that means we have something to hide you know like who you tell people don't come to my room when your room is dirty but if you you know if you kept it clean you're like please no go ahead you know because it's like this mindset of like we we think that people will find something that will shake our faith. And if that is it, we haven't understood Orthodox Tawahidu at all. With that being said, the more I was learning, even before I went, I, I, I joined uh, this uh, program, I, I kept saying, I can't believe people don't know this stuff. Like, I can't believe. Like, like, if only people knew why we confessed, right? Like, if only people knew why we did liturgy. If only people knew. And it was, like, this thing that kind of, like, started my whole um, uh, interest of, like, teaching and, like, even how I got into teaching. In terms of the book, and I, I read in the preface, uh, you know, it was really a book that was written over a period of, like, 10 years that I've been teaching. Wow. Because these are the questions, these are the, the conversations that I had and all this stuff. When it comes to like saying, I'm going to write a book and writing it, I wrote it in like two weeks or three weeks. Right? But it was like, already, it was just there. Because these yeah. are, you know, something that was acquired over like a, a long period of time. So I just knew what to say. It's um, like a frequently was, asked questions. There you go. Per chapter, you know, they just discuss different things. So um, that's kind of what it was. And it, like, if people really understood it, I mean, uh, take, for example, uh, the, the chapter on homosexuality. Uh, people have, even from the LGBTQ community, has told me, uh, they may not agree with me, but they appreciate at least the presentation of saying, okay, like, I know the stance of the church and why they do it. I don't agree with it. I still think it's wrong, but I, 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 get, I get it. Like, I, I get it. That makes sense. So This is what you were meant earlier when you said Orthodox Tawahado, differentiating, I always say it when I talk about that subject, which is cultural taboo versus the official teaching of the church. And a lot of times people are leading the conversation with whatever their cultural taboo was, as opposed to, you know, this is, you know, scripture or liturgy or something that you can point to as a masikr. Yeah, you know, one of my mentors back in the day, the best kind of advice he gave me is you can find a biblical verse for anything if you want to, right? Like, so if you have this, like, a hate inside of you, you could, you know, of course, you have to do a little massaging, but you can look, look, and I'm pointing to, look, God killed those people, you know? So there, there are things that you can always point to to get your point across. So we have to be careful to understand the true message of orthodoxy, tawahedo. What really is it? And it comes down to peace. It comes to down to love. It's not about the knowledge that you accrue. I think these things are just—I uh, don't even know what to call them—but it's just like mechanisms used in order to show people, look, the truth is here. So I—that's what the book was trying to do. Um, I—I was in that book as I was writing it. I was careful not to show like look knowledge like i'm gonna give you knowledge that wasn't the point the point was just like look orthodoxy is beautiful i know you have this idea of what it looks like and probably why you're leaving the church as most young people are it's really not like that it's really like this 
so just to you know clear the perspective so that was kind of the the point that's beautiful and and everyone could find it at Amazon, I'm assuming, or is there a direct uh, source? Either Amazon or Amazon, depending on how you pronounce it. <laughs> and it's just, Thank you. I, that, that, that's good. I've I've seen fathers who don't understand when I say water, and when I say water, they say, "Why didn't you say so in the first place?" Okay, okay, okay. So, depending on our listeners, uh, so just I need answers, and it, and it comes out there. So. Uh, that is uh, the first book that's out there. Who knows? There might be a second. That's good. That's good. Give him a little good shot. Uh, of yeah, the- there you go. <laughs> so you you mentioned this earlier, and I just I I feel like I want to tackle this uh, uh, before we we get out of here, and and again want to get you on for as many different topics as you can. Maybe one day we'll even uh, pull up some of the, the hundreds of manuscripts that you've mentioned, hopefully if we're allowed to, and <laughs> read them, look at them, kind of show people, right. kind of give a behind the curtains view of what it's like to be a scholar at that level and hopefully inspire people who will join the academy or, or school of EOTC that hopefully one day you're a founder of, which I'm excited uh, for that. Uh, Abu Namarkas Eric, who recently reposed uh, of blessed memory, his dream was always like elementary school and theological school. And he okay. he mentioned it so many times and uh, he didn't get to see it while he was around here. But but I know there are some efforts to to make a uh, kind of K to 12 school in Kansas. And I, I had been pushing for it here in Los Angeles as well. It hasn't panned out yet. And, and the pandemic certainly didn't help. But yeah, I think we need education at, at all levels. In fact, I think we need hospitals and everything else associated. Uh, you know, the Catholics in, in this regard are, are great examples. And especially because we have so many people, uh, you know, who are intelligent and could go the route of school and also who are are in the healthcare field. But I, I experienced in a few of the jobs that I have taken this idea called uh, tokenization, which sometimes if uh, maybe more are suburban Habashas, maybe less the Habashas who grow around Habashas, but the Habashas who grow up in white neighborhoods or something like that, where sometimes, you know, if you're the only Habasha kid at a private school or or a local public school that's just not in a densely black area you know they want to put you on the website they want to say that they have you without necessarily getting more people like you or making any structural or or systemic changes it stuck out to me as tokenization when you said that people kind of wanted their church or parish to be known as a parish where there is english language service but they didn't want to invest in you. I mean, the bare minimum would be to get out of your way. Uh, the ideal situation would have been had they sponsored your trip to, to <laughs> Debra Libanos. You know, if you if you had a really visionary church and they saw some something like the interest that someone like you had, you know, either sponsoring your education in the academia here or in the traditional schools, to me – is just something that makes sense. And again, if, if you look at the, how organized the Catholics are, it's one of the things uh, they do. Has, has that kind of tokenization that it sounds like you experience this, like we, we want to say we're doing this, but we're not really doing this. Have you seen any improvement over the years? I mean, this is not your first rodeo. You've, you've been at this service now for several years. H- have you seen anything that, that gives you a little more hope? I mean, part of it is that you said you saw more people interested in things like Mahalit and, and Kene, which is, is one, I think, partial answer to that. You're going to get me in trouble today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already uh, like in deep waters. Um, let me think about how to say this without like uh, getting in trouble. So, like, our f- we can't forget what our fathers have done and what they're doing. Like, we can't forget. So when I speak emotionally, I just want to say, that, like, I'm speaking to my father, right? Like, so I'm, I'm not speaking to an enemy. I'm not speaking to 
uh, someone else, I'm speaking to my father. So it's out of love. And I just, I, cause it's important that people understand this. I'm, I'm not bashing like just people. It's just my fathers. And because they're my fathers, I demand things as a child. Do you see, I'm not asking for it. I'm demanding. It's my right as your child, as your child, I am demanding the following things. And number one is enough attention to the Sunday school program. At the time, I don't know if people understood how important it was. The attention, uh, and, and this goes back to the idea and the philosophy of like, look, uh, we don't really like, uh, what is Ethiopian Orthodox? Learning Amaranya. Okay, so uh, what is a good Orthodox person? Someone who speaks Amaranya, Amatwa uh, means Om and stuff like. Like it, it is. So what was it, the invest? Uh, the investment was we teach Amaranya. Yeah. By the way, uh, which I opposed openly. <laughs> Open. And I wow. think that that's the problem is because a lot of parents would bring their kids so that they learn Amaranya. Yeah. Right. And my thing is, look, we have to understand the church and say, we've got to teach these kids uh, about Christianity. Look, I was 1920 when my Sunday school students, 15, 14, were coming to me telling me they were raped. Uh, some of them uh, were pregnant and were thinking about abortion. Uh, and, and like people were running away and like, uh, some of them were involved in, in, in gangs and they had guns at 19. I'm not equipped to handle these situations. Do you see? I had nothing but love. I didn't even know the Bible that well. There was nothing that I could provide to them except for my time. These type of resources in terms of, and, and you, when we talk about resources, we shouldn't sugarcoat it, but it's, it's money, Right. Money has to be allocated to these programs, especially for Sunday school pro uh, teachers. Look, I'm not a Sunday school teacher anymore. Like uh, right now, I just don't have the time. Of course, like uh, we're under COVID, but like we've got to take time to really invest. We have like uh, we invest in preachers, we invest in priests. We've got to invest money wise in the Sunday school uh, teachers so that they're committed so that they, 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 that, that they come and they're able to serve in a way that they can. And it's not like they just come in whenever they want and they leave whenever they want. I yeah. mean, like people need to understand part of the thing that works with Sunday school program that I can tell you, it's not knowledge. It's not how well you talk. It's about trusting you. Like, uh, you know, I don't want, I don't want to like brag or whatever, but it's just for a lesson. When, Kids, I had a college student who wasted his money and asked me to pay for his rent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, why didn't he call his parents? Because he trusted me, right? So once you establish that, that, that trust, then you can say, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the church. Let me tell you about like how beautiful our tradition is. That comes not only once a su Sunday you come and you teach and you leave, but it's that, it's the, that t attachment that you have. Uh, we need to learn a lot from the Protestants. Yes, I said that the Protestants, that wasn't an accident. We need to learn from them. It's because they have programs that they do that really, really work. Um, and we need to mimic that. Um, so yeah, I like in terms of that, I don't think enough attention and resources have been given. Uh, from the vantage point of the church, we don't have a lot of money to begin with. Our, 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 our people don't believe in tithing. Uh, they want they want the church to exist. They don't understand how it operates. People eat, people sleep, people have you know lives, and uh, we can't just demand something from clergy members uh, without understanding. Like, look, they have they're human beings. Like, people burn out. You can't expect someone to just do things without like thinking about the burden there is on that person. So. The church is always focused on like, how can we get more money? You know, so uh, resources are given towards, and I shouldn't say the church, but administration, right? Administration is focused on these things. I've always said, if you, let's forget about spiritual life, not, not forever, but for this conversation. So if you want to think about money, invest in these, in this youth programs. And I'm going to say something very mean, but it's true. 
these kids are going to go to college, become do doctors and lawyers, and you get them to invest. Like once they come back to the church, they'll be giving tithings and yeah. that's how you make more money instead of the taxi drivers, right? Like, I mean, like this is like just thinking about simply from the financial perspective. <laughs> when you add the spiritual, there's more reason. So I'm there sure. have been more initiatives. I've talked to great people uh, who are really, really like, but like they really are concerned about the youth and in Misa Tualu, uh, which I'm glad to see fathers like this. I've seen uh, a bishop in Atlanta who who is very much uh, Abu Salama. I don't know if you would like. He's he's yeah. a genuine. Like I, he called me and I, I I was like, what did I do wrong? He was just checking up on me. I was like, <laughs> that's never that's never happened to me. This has never happened. Uh, Abba Filippos, I have to mention him, you know, like again, another, yep, yeah. like he's just like, so there are people out there who are genuine. We need more. We need more. Yeah. That's, that's, that's real. Uh, and that's a, that's a real plea that I hope people hear. And honestly, I don't think that was that controversial. It'll ruffle some feathers, but I, I appreciate the the kind of nuance and the balance in which you you said that i think it's good to wrap up now and just in case we missed anything that you wanted to cover that we didn't do you have any sort of parting thoughts or advice to people on the road be they younger deacons be they choir members be they sunday school teachers or just members of the faithful and and laity who uh may be excited to uh, hear us link up here and uh, any anything to encourage them so that they are among those who endure to the end and are saved? Uh, love requires a lot of work. Um, wh wherever we are, uh, people say love doesn't cost a thing. Yes, it does. Um, it costs Christ his life, right? So he died on the cross for, for the sake of love. None of this matters if we don't love each other. None of this whole conversation, uh, like all, not, none of that really matters at the end of the day. If we can't get all those prayers, all those things to have fruit, right? And that fruit is for us to love each other. The knowledge, the reading, though, all of these things. If we can't at the end of the day say, you know what? The prayers are making me uh, forgive people. The 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 uh, the satat is making me more calm. Or if there is no effect, I mean, like, what is the point if we keep fighting with each other? Like, we have to create a world where we can just be more loving, more kind, uh, and where we always have to strive for unity, even though it's hard even though it's hard. <laughs> so we're starting off or we're ending off how we started, but you know, like that's, uh, uh, that's the nature of it. Amen. May he have you here, his word of life. Amen. Amen. Amen.